This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Thank you for watching this video today. My name is Eddie Parrish, and this is the first in a series of lessons on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It might be helpful for you to know that as we go through this series, I'll be using the New King James Version of the Bible. People who travel extensively to other countries will tell you that each country has its own personality. For example, people who live in China are different from the people who live in Israel, who are different from the people who live in Nigeria. And so when Americans, for example, travel to other countries, they often stand out, uh, as do other people from countries who then travel to America. It's just the way it is because the personalities are different. Christians are citizens of a very special kingdom. Christians are members of, citizens of, the kingdom of God. We read in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13, these words from the Apostle Paul. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's the kingdom that Christians are a part of. And in what some people have called the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus describes the personality of the person who is to be or who is a member of His kingdom. Just like earthly kingdoms, earthly nations have personality, so do those who make up the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus presented it from a, a mountainous region or a hilly region. There is uh, some speculation regarding the exact location of where this happened, but it was on the, somewhere on the, uh, the northern part of uh, the area around the Sea of Galilee, not far from uh, the city of Capernaum. But though we don't know exactly uh, the specific location of it, there are some general uh, ideas of where it may well have been. But that's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount, because it was in kind of a, uh, a mountainous or hilly uh, region of that part of the world. And it's going to be our focus in this series of lessons to center our thoughts and our attention on this great sermon that Jesus preached. Today's lesson is specifically on matters of introduction. We're going to look at the theme of the sermon and we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, the challenge of the sermon uh, and kind of give somewhat of a summary of some of the things that are taught therein uh, just to kind of lay a foundation uh, to help us uh, get ready for kind of breaking down the text and looking at it in a little more detail. And so let's begin with this particular session by looking at the theme of the sermon. A key theme in the book of Matthew as a whole is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. As a matter of fact, that uh, terminology references to the kingdom. Uh, that word kingdom is used some 55 times in the 28 chapters of the book of Matthew. And so it is a, 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 a principal primary thought or theme in the sermon. Many of the parables in the book of Matthew begin with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then you'll see uh, certain uh, references uh, to uh, things that, that the kingdom of heaven is similar to. Uh, you find it in passages like Matthew 13, verse 24, uh, verse 31, verse 33, uh, all of those using that, uh, that reference, the kingdom of heaven is like. So the kingdom is a major part of uh, Matthew's gospel account. It's one of the major themes. And it's also the key theme in the Sermon on the Mount uh, because Jesus will use the terminology often uh, in the sermon uh, 
But also in this particular section of Matthew, in these early chapters, it's also a key theme. If you'll notice, uh, if you have your your Bible there and you're looking at it, in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 3, leading up to the sermon, we have references to the kingdom here in in, uh, the gospel account, Matthew 3 verse 2 that uh, John the Baptist uh, came preaching and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see it again in chapter 4 of Matthew, verse number 17. From that time, the text says, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse uh, 23 of chapter 4, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So right there, just in those uh, two chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 4, leading into the Sermon on the Mount, you have these references to the kingdom. That was the topic that Matthew wanted his readers to be exposed to early on because it's going to be a major part of of uh, his gospel account, one of the major emphases. And that's what we're going to see in the sermon. Now if we'll just look at the Sermon on the Mount itself, beginning in chapter 5, we'll see uh, several references to the kingdom. Look at verse number 3. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see it again in verse number 10. Uh, Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You look down in verses 19 and 20, you have a reference to those who, are, who would be the least in the kingdom of heaven versus those called great in the kingdom of heaven. If you look further, chapter 6, verse number 10, in the model prayer, Jesus uh, included a, a statement there, Your kingdom uh, come, which He instructed His disciples then uh, to pray. Later in chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then into chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So there are several places there within the sermon itself where Jesus references the kingdom of heaven. And so it has to be a major theme of the sermon. Uh, because it's mentioned so often, and indeed it is. And as we go through the sermon in subsequent lessons, uh, we'll be able to see and emphasize even more uh, what Jesus says about the kingdom, about its nature, and about uh, the citizens who are a part of it and what their character is like. So that's the major theme of the sermon, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. But before we move on to the challenge of the sermon... Let's think for just a moment about the nature of this kingdom. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, of what are we speaking? What is the kingdom? What is its nature? What is it like? Let me offer you these thoughts for your consideration and your further study. First of all, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is not a political entity. When we think about kingdoms, uh, that's what we normally think about. We think about earthly uh, nations or empires, uh, you know, physical kingdoms. And and many people, when they think about the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, they think of it in those same kind of terms. They think about it as a political entity or uh, a a physical kingdom. But the kingdom of Christ is not a political entity. It's not physical in nature. nature, It's spiritual in nature. Jesus will make that point uh, at the time of His arrest when He is uh, before Pilate. And Pilate is questioning Him about who He is because He's been uh, He's been accused of, of uh, being uh, the king of the Jews and, and uh, people are, are uh, wanting him dealt with in the severest of fashions and, and, and Pilate's trying to figure out all of this and he's questioning Jesus. And so in the context of that conversation, Jesus says with reference to his kingdom, uh, 
My kingdom is not of this world. John 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. He continues by saying, if it were, my servants would fight for it. But my kingdom, he said, is not from here. Now, like I said a moment ago, a lot of people, when they think about the kingdom, they think of it in those terms, that it is of this world, or at least that it will be. People have the idea about the kingdom that it uh, doesn't exist now. It's, sometime, it's going to be established sometime in the future, and it'll be physical in nature, in nature material, uh, political. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus said, my kingdom is not from here. It is not of this world. It's spiritual in nature, not political or material. So when we talk about the kingdom of Christ, we're talking about uh, God's rule or God's authority being exercised in the lives of individuals. And that's one way in which I have uh, heard the kingdom described, and I think it's, it's well stated that way that the kingdom of God is the spiritual rule or the spiritual reign of Jesus Christ in the hearts of individuals. I think about uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21 in that respect, where Jesus addressed the kingdom and the nature of it. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Now when He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Isn't that interesting? People wanted to know when the kingdom would come. And Jesus said, Well, first of all, let me remind you of this that the kingdom of God is not going to come with observation. And people are not going to be able to say, see here or see there. His point there was not that people wouldn't in any way be able to identify the kingdom, but he was trying to counteract the idea that those people had that the kingdom was going to be material and physical in nature. And so he, he was trying to, to, to discredit that false concept. So he said the kingdom is not going to come with observation like that. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, how can the kingdom of God be within you if it's a physical, material, political, earthbound thing? The kingdom of God is spiritual in nature. Uh, John chapter 18, verse 36. Now, the material, excuse me, the, 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 the uh, manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth is seen in those individuals who make up the church. Uh, that, that, that is the kingdom of God. We pointed out earlier from Colossians 1 verse 13 that the kingdom existed even in the first century. When Paul said, you've been taken out of the kingdom of this world and been placed into the kingdom of His dear Son. So the kingdom existed then. And when Jesus promised to establish His church in Matthew 16 verses 18 and 19, He used the terminology of church and kingdom in an interchangeable fashion in, in that passage. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, verse 18 of Matthew 16. And then in verse 19, he said to Peter and the other apostles, I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was not switching subjects from verse 18 to verse 19 when he said, I'll build my church and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. He's using church and kingdom in an interchangeable fashion there. So the church existed in the first century, uh, and the church, being the kingdom, tells us the kingdom existed then as well. So the visible manifestation of the kingdom on earth is the church that Jesus promised to build and did build. And so the nature of the church is it's spiritual, not political. Uh, it involves the rule of Christ in the hearts of individuals. Its visible manifestation is the church and the church, the kingdom rather, is destined for heaven ultimately. When all is said and done in this life and God wraps up the affairs of this existence, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 that at that time the Lord will deliver His kingdom up to the Father for His eternal care 
and safekeeping. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. So in addressing the theme of the sermon, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, it is the spiritual rule of Christ in the hearts of individuals, visibly seen in the church, which is made up of those individuals in whose heart the Lord reigns. And the church is that kingdom that's destined for glory. And so in this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is defining for us the ideal spiritual character of the individual in whose heart Jesus reigns as King. And so to follow Jesus is to respect and develop the characteristics that He describes in this sermon. And that should be the goal of each of us. So that's the theme of the sermon. Now let's turn our attention to the challenge of the sermon. And to do that, we're going to look at a, a number of passages within uh, those chapters, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and look at some of the things that he talks about that relate to our character. So this will be kind of a foundational uh, portion that will hopefully set the stage for a more in-depth study as we work ourselves through this series. But if Jesus rules your heart and your life, then you're going to think and act differently from folks who have someone or something else ruling their hearts and their lives. And this is a point that comes out often in the Sermon on the Mount. And I really want you to think about that and, and let, it, let it really sink into your mind because this is where the challenge of this sermon comes in. One of the things that Jesus is going to do throughout this sermon is call attention to things that they had heard, things that they had seen in the lives of a lot of their religious leaders. And then he's going to contrast that with how an individual who's a member of his kingdom is supposed to act or is intended uh, to act. So he's going to show a, 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 uh, a comparison, a contrast between what they knew versus what they needed to know, what they had been taught to be versus what they really needed to be. And so that's one of the keys in... Uh, in the, the sermon, the emphasis of it is this difference. And that's where the challenge comes in. And I suspect as we study through this, that challenge is going to come, uh, is going to, come to bear on us pretty uh, heavily as we recognize probably some areas in which we need to change in contrast to perhaps what we have been previously taught or what we had previously understood. And that's where the challenge is going to come in. But let's look at some of these examples in the sermon where Jesus calls on this contrast. And one of the keys is in chapter 5, uh, verse 20, which I believe is, is a key, if not the key element or passage in grasping really the, the thrust of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is starting right there this, this heavy thrust on contrasting what they had been taught versus what they really needed to be. So he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't even enter the kingdom. And it's right after that that he begins the major section in chapter 5 where he says, all right, you've heard that it was said this, I'm telling you this. And so he's contrasting what they had been taught by their religious leaders versus what they really needed to know, what they had been taught versus what they had missed what those religious leaders had not emphasized like they should. And so again, the contrast is there. Uh, being different from what you had been taught to be. How about, uh, I mentioned these uh, passages where Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, but I say unto you. There are several of those. Verse 21 uh, is uh, one of those. Chapter 5, You've heard that it was said uh, to those of old, You shall not murder. 
And then he's going to follow that up by saying, But I say unto you, don't even be angry without cause uh, with your brother, and so forth. He'll, he'll say it again in verse 27. You heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, don't even allow lust to get a foothold in your heart. So here's what you've been taught. Here's what was emphasized. Here's what wasn't. Here's what you missed. Here's the part that you really need to focus on. How about verse uh, 31? Um, uh, here's, here's what has been said. You know, whoever divorces his wife, for example, uh, let him give her a certificate. But I say unto you, again, the contrast in verse 32. Verse 33, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, don't swear falsely. But I say unto you, verse 34. Uh, verse 38, you've heard that it was said, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. And then again in verse 43, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. So throughout, especially chapter 5, but again, you'll see it in, in other portions of the sermon. Jesus makes the contrast and challenges his listeners then and the readers uh, of this today that there are differences between what some people's idea of being right and faithful to God, what their ideas are, versus what the truth is. And that's where we'll be challenged as we study through this sermon. Here's another contrast. In chapter 5, verse 46, he'll make a contrast with uh, the tax collectors. Uh, if, you, um, if you love those who love you, he says, verse 46, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? So here's what they do. Here's what I want you to do. You see it again uh, with uh, the Gentiles, verse 47 of uh, chapter 5. If you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors uh, the same? So these... these um, uh, these contrasts are calling attention to things that they needed to challenge themselves to change. And so as we look at those uh, passages later in some detail, we'll see uh, further applications. How about chapter 6, uh, verse 2, another, uh, another contrast. Also in verse 16 where he contrasts the hypocrites. Uh, don't do as the hypocrites do in the streets as they... Um, uh, in the synagogues and in the streets, verse 2, that they may have glory from men. They do their good deeds to be seen by others. He says, all right, that's what you've seen in others. I'm telling you, don't do that. Don't be like them. I'm calling on you to live a life that's different from that. How about uh, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 6 where he says, um, when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, the Gentiles do. And he talks about that. He says, all right, this is what they do. I'm telling you, don't do that. Uh, don't follow their, their bad example. Chapter 7, verse 15, he talks about the false prophets. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So that's what they are. You need to be aware of that, and you need to avoid them. And then one more of these contrasts in chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Here's a warning about those who claim allegiance to him, but their, their claim isn't followed up with uh, appropriate action, with obedience. He says, again, don't be like that. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to do more than just, than just mouth your allegiance. It's going to take actual obedience to God in order to do that. So, um, so all of those things are uh, challenges. They were challenges to his readers, uh, or to his listeners then, and to us who read these things today, to accept the fact that one cannot follow him and also, at the same time, blend in with the world that's around us. And therein is the major challenge of the sermon. Because in a lot of instances, that tends to be what we do as human beings. 
we don't want to stick out a lot of times from the crowd. We just want to kind of blend in. If it means uh, go along to get along, uh, then many folks will do that. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying that's not the proper way to go. And if you're going to be a citizen of my kingdom, and as a citizen of his kingdom with him being king, then that means we are subject to him, subject to his authority. In other words, we have to do what he says. He's our king. We are his subjects. And so to be a citizen of his kingdom means you can't just blend in with the crowd and live just like everybody else does. So we'll see in the sermon that Jesus will emphasize the fact that your, your moral and ethical standards are different. You see, their moral and ethical standards evidently was just based on what they were taught by the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus said, you're going to have to do better than that. Except your righteousness exceed theirs, you won't enter the kingdom. So your ethical standards and, and the, the standard by which you judge conduct is going to have to be different than what you're used to as far as, as uh, your judgment is concerned. Your uh, priorities are going to be different. You want to be a citizen of my kingdom? Then you have to seek the kingdom first. Matthew 6, Other things have to take a back seat to that, so your priorities will be different. Your attitude toward money is going to be different. Uh, your uh, approach to the Word of God is going to be different. Some people think, I'm afraid, that uh, they can be a follower of Jesus without actually uh, being a follower of Jesus. And what I mean by that is some people just want to be able to say and claim, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, which to a lot of people means that uh, they believe that Jesus was a real person, uh, that he was even the Son of God. Uh, he did a lot of good things, and, uh, and I like that, and I like him. And so that makes me a Christian. Not according to Jesus. All of these things will have to be different from everybody else. All of these ethical standards, priorities, your view of marriage and divorce will be different. You'll treat your enemies differently. All of those things are a part of the process of being a citizen of His kingdom. Few things, I'm afraid, have hurt the influence of Christianity in the world as much as hypocrisy where people's words and actions don't match. Well, this sermon challenges everyone who wants to follow Jesus to actually follow Him, to not just claim to follow Him, but to actually do it. And with that kind of a challenging message, it's no wonder that the response was what it was. If you'll look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, Verses 28 and 29, the Bible says, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When the people heard Jesus, when He finished, they knew they were dealing with a different person than what they were used to. And His teaching astonished them. Hopefully by the end of this series of lessons, we'll be astonished too. Not at my words, but at His in this great sermon on the mount. The bar has been set high, but it's certainly not uh, unattainable. And so as we embark on this study of this great sermon, may we all commit ourselves to letting Jesus reign in our hearts unopposed. This is a production of World Video Bible School.